Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session of Invited Talks of ICM uh, 2022. My name is Tong Yang from City University of Hong Kong. It's my great honor to chair this session. The speaker of this session is Professor Alessandro Ilusku from Princeton University. Professor Ilusku is a world leading expert in partial differential equations, in particular about the study on the physical models arising from water waves, plasma evolution, and gravitation. He has made fundamental contribution to the quantitative and qualitative description of solutions to this system and their long-term dynamics in vigorous mathematics. The title of Professor Yerusko's talk today is On the Global Stability of Shear Flows and Vortices. Uh, let's welcome Professor uh, Yerusko. You can share your PPT. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Yang, for the for the introduction. And uh, I'd also like to thank uh, uh, the organizers for the kind invitation. It's a privilege to be part of this congress. Uh, I'm going to talk about work that um, is a work that I've done uh, uh, with my collaborator Hao Jia. So all of this work is work with Hao Jia. Uh, he's a professor at um, University of Minnesota, and um, our work is about um, the incompressible. Euler equation in the simplest case, the incompressible Euler equation in two dimensions, uh, which reads uh, the it's a very standard equation, of course, reads dt u plus u great u plus gradient of the pressure is equal to zero, and the divergence of u is equal to zero. And in two dimensions, so u consists of two components: u is u1 and u2. And um, the pressure, the pressure is a scalar, so the gradient of the pressure becomes a, a vector of 2D vector. Uh, now, in two dimensions, the easiest way, to, the, the most efficient way to look at the equation is through what's called the vorticity formulation. Uh, the vorticity formulation is, um, in terms of the vorticity, the vorticity is omega. Um, and um, the, the vorticity formulation is dt omega. It's an active scalar equation. It's dt omega plus u grad omega is equal to zero, where u is recovered in terms of the vorticity, actually in terms of the stream function. So there's a stream function that's... Uh, uh, that, that's determined in such a way that its Laplace is equal to the vorticity, and then uh, the vector field u is the gradient perpendicular of the stream function. So if we so uh, this is a self self contained system, if we know the vorticity omega, which now becomes a scalar, then we can calculate uh, the stream function, and we can calculate the uh, the vector field u, and then um, everything makes sense in the equation. So we can we can uh, we can increment the time, and we can move to the next time. Now, of course, it's a very well-studied equation in two dimensions. Uh, this is a very well-studied equation, and it's known that smooth solutions exist and uh, remain glo uh, exist globally and remain smooth. So if we start with nice initial data, then the solution is going to stay of the same type as the initial data and exist and globally in time. Um, this, this is a classical theorem of Waldner. Um, the vorticity is transported in the sense that at all the other times, the vorticity is a rearrangement of the original vorticity. In particular, uh, all the LP norms of the vorticity are concerned, conserved during the time evolution. Uh, now, um, so that's uh, um, um, so that's the so that's what's known, and uh, of course, uh, um, there, there are a lot, there are many other things that are known. However, what what's very challenging is to understand the uh, the, uh, the long time behavior of the solution. So, what happens? What does the solution wants to do? Uh, asymptotically as the time goes to infinity. Uh, this is this is very, very difficult to understand because there is no uh, global relaxation mechanism. So the vorticity being transported means that at any other time, nothing has decayed. If, at, at best, it didn't get worse, but there is no way it gets smaller uh, through the evolution. Uh, now, more realistic, what we can do, uh, this is a general conjecture that I'm, I, I'm going to mention briefly at the end. Uh, more realistic, what we can do mathematically, uh, is to understand the global linear dynamics of solutions uh, that are close to steady state. So we can look, um, we can look at steady states of the 2D Euler, and there are two classes that are very important. Two classes of steady states that are very important, and we can look for initial data that's around these steady states. And uh, um, so that's so. So we study we study the evolution corresponding to this initial data. 
Um, now, there are two classes of uh, very important steady states, namely the shear flows. So the ones that I'm going to talk about are called the shear flows and the vortices. Uh, they are particularly important because um, the, there are many numerical simulations uh, that show that these this, uh, states, in particular the vortices, they tend to form dynamically. So even though they are, uh, one can start from solutions that have nothing to do with vortices, uh, vortex is just a radial function. So radial functions in the vorticity formulation are uh, stationary solutions. All radial functions are stationary solutions of the 2D Euler. Um, so it, uh, what I was saying is that there are numerical simulations that show that these forces tend to form dynamically during the evolution, even though the initial data is nothing to do with radial functions. Um, so this has been uh, this has been studied a lot. And it's a very very classical problem. It's a very appealing problem. It's probably one of the most studied problems in hydrodynamics. Uh, the work uh, goes back at least to um, at least to papers from the 1800s. There are two papers that are usually being uh, uh, that are usually being um, uh, thought of as the original references, papers of Raleigh and Kelvin. Um, the, the two papers from 1880 on the stability of in or instability of certain fluid motions and stability of fluid motion, rectilinear motion of viscous fluid between two plates. Uh, one of them refers to a problem posed by Stokes okay, a few decades earlier. Um, that's that's actually harder to find. Um, so these are very. Uh, there's been a lot of work on uh, what's called mode stability. So there are various layers at which one can understand the stability. One can understand it the level of the full nonlinear level, which is what we want to do today. But the way the work started was to look at the linearized level and actually in an even easier situation at the level of what's called mode stability. Um, now to understand what to to, to see a simple simple example of how this works. Uh, I'm going to discuss the simplest example, namely uh, the example of the quet flow in some, at the linearized level, it's all explicit and we can understand how it works. Uh, but let's put in a slightly more general setting. So we are looking at shear flows. Shear flows are, are, are solutions of the form B of Y comma zero. So if we are in two dimensions and we have this type of vector field, the, it has one component equal to zero and the other component depends on the, on the second variable on the other variable, then that's a, that's a shear flow, that's, that's a stationary solution. Uh, so, um, so the stationary solution. So the uh, so this uh, this stationary solution. Uh, this is a stationary solution of the two D Euler, and one can one can look at the per perturbation. And if we write um, uh, if we write the equation, uh, so if we write if we write this equation at the level of the vorticity, so uh, looking at the vorticity of the four minus b prime of y, which would be coming from the shear flow plus omega. So omega now becomes the the primary variable. This vorticity deviation. Then the Euler equation becomes this, uh, this system. So it's dt omega plus b, b of y dx omega minus b double prime of y dx psi plus u times grad psi. So the last part is a nonlinear part is equal to zero. And u is recovered as before uh, from the stream function. Psi is recovered by looking at uh, delta psi is equal to, by solving delta psi is equal to omega. And then u is recovered by taking derivatives of psi. Um, now in the simplest case, uh, one can write everything very explicitly, but it's still very instructive to understand how it works. Uh, the simplest case is B of Y is linear. B of Y is equal to Y, for example, or B of Y is linear. The point is that B double prime of Y, if B were linear, B double prime of Y drops out. So this term that's hard, that this term that's uh, non-local and it's harder to understand, uh, drops out if we are looking in the, um, uh, at the quet flow. And uh, if we are just to just to do all the calculations explicit, you are pretending that the interval uh, there is an interval of i. There is an interval in the variable y that uh, uh, we get to choose. So we are assuming that this interval, for simplicity, is equal to the entire real line. And in this case, the linearized the linearized equation. So if we remove the nonlinearity, the last term, and we remove this uh, this non-local term, then we are, we are left with some very simple equation, dt omega plus y dx omega is equal to zero. This can be solved explicitly. Of course, so omega of txy is omega node of x minus y t comma y. So this is an explicit calculation. Um, it's uh, good to do this at the level of every mode of modes. So we take, uh, uh, so the variable x, the variable x that I said here, as I said here, the variable x is on the torus for this to make sense. So the variable x is on the torus. So you can look at the uh, towards the dimension one, the circle. So you can look at the modes, and the modes are omega k, and each mode evolves according to this simple equation: omega k of ty is e to the minus i k ty times omega naught k. So the kth mode at time t is equal to zero of y. 
So we have this very simple equation and we can understand this, of course. And uh, what we notice is that for all k different from zero, when k is equal to zero, nothing changes. So when k is equal to zero, the, the zero mode omega, uh, omega zero of ty is just omega zero of y doesn't change because that's, that's a stationary solution. Now for any other k, what, hap what happens, what we see here is that for any other k, as the time goes to infinity, the solution converges weakly to zero because we have this very fast oscillation in the minus i k t y, which means that the solution converges weakly to zero. It doesn't convert strongly to zero. There is no, we expect that we are in the case of the Euler equation, so there is no, no decay in the solution. Uh, it doesn't convert strongly to zero, but it converges weakly to zero. Uh, now we can also understand the other quantities that are important in the Euler equation. You can understand the stream function and we have an explicit formula for the kth mode of the stream function. And here we move it to the Fourier space to understand uh, because I want I, I want to make sense of uh, other other quantities as well. So in the Fourier space, uh, the formula that we get for the Fourier transform in Y of the kth mode, we get um, we get this formula omega node that the Fourier transform omega node at the point c plus k t divided by k squared plus c squared. Um, now um, if we um, so if we uh, think that the initial data is smooth, so we start with nice initial data, uh, then uh, morally this, this variable C plus KT has to be localized around zero because the initial data was smooth. So it will be localized at frequency close to one. This means that C uh, would have to uh, see the, the main, the, the frequency, the main frequency that, that contributes at time T would have to move in time. So it's minus KT plus O one. And what we get from here is that Psi K, so C is minus KT plus O one. This means that, um, so if you think that k is fixed, so let's think that k is like one, for example, uh, then this means that psi k will decay qualitatively at least like one over k squared times t to the minus two. The t to the minus two comes from the denominator. Uh, now we have to take derivatives to get the, uh, to get the velocity. So you get ux will decay like uh, one over k times one over t and do ui will decay like one over k times one over t squared. And, um, and the, the main observation is that, <clears throat> so at the level of the, so we do have decay at the level of the stream function and at the level of the uh, of the velocity. And this is good because uh, what, what really matters, of course, the vorticity itself cannot decay, but in order to be able to think that we are gonna reach some kind of final state and we, we can try to prove some, some asymptotic stability, we need that the nonlinear part decays. And the nonlinear part is transported by a vector field that suppose at least at the linear level decays. Um, okay, so that's basically, I'm summarizing here what we've seen. This is the so-called mechanism of NVC damping. The non-zero mode of the vorticity oscillates faster and faster as the time goes to zero. Um, so weekly, it will, go, it, will, uh, it will go to zero weekly. Now, um, uh, the vo now the vorticity going to high and fire frequency means that the velocity fields themselves, they go to zero. And uh, if the, the velocity is the one that transports the vorticity, so in principle, one could hope to close this scheme and prove that there is some form of uh, asymptotic, uh, asymptotic control of the solution at infinity. Um, now, this is just a very, it's kind of a naive picture, this is kind of what one would like to do, but there are several uh, major issues to, um, that one needs to understand. Um, some of them are not in the case of the quet flow. So the, for the quet flow, uh, one of the terms disappears, but in the, for, for other shear flows, B of Y comma zero, uh, there are solutions that are non that, that are non-decaying modes. So one uh, even at the linear uh, the, the picture of uh, the picture of this decay is not true even at the linear level because there would be uh, there would be solution that that, that, that would not be decaying. Um, now um, there is one more. Uh, there are, so I'm listing here three issues that uh, come in at the non-linear level, and the first one actually comes in at the linear level as well. Uh, the second important issue to understand is the effect of the boundary. So you're now working uh, on the entire real line. It turns out that the boundary is a very important effect in this. So the, if, if we are working on a finite, finite channel when, uh, on, a, on a bounded interval, that it makes a big difference because the effect itself does not want to, uh, does not want to cooperate with this inviscid damping picture, the effect of the boundary. And uh, um, another very, another important issue is that for the this specific for the nonlinear problem, uh, in the nonlinear problem, we expect that the final state. So in order to prove asymptotic stability, we need to understand the final state. So we need to show, we need to understand what happens to the solution as the time goes to infinity. Um, now, what um, we expect is that uh, the final state is going to be a different shear flow. 
it doesn't have to be the same. We are starting from nearby one, near one shear flow, but we can converge to a different one nearby uh, another uh, nearby shear flow. And there's a very large family of shear flows. So uh, the any function of the form u of y comma zero, so any any vector field of this form is a potential final state. And you have a very large space of these, such. Uh, so it's not like a two-dimensional family of solitons. It's an infinite-dimensional family of uh, potential final states. And the um, the only way to to understand uh, is that the one has to make sense of which uh, the flow itself has to select which final state to converge to. Um, now. Um, so there are lots of results. The problem, as I said, goes back at the level of the linear stability. There are lots of results, and I'm not going to. I'm not going to discuss uh, uh, more more than what I've said so far. The explicit example I've discussed so far, uh, but there are lots of results, and once you think that they go back, so the, these are the first the original papers, Raleigh and Kelvin. This work of Orr, Taylor, Fadev, McWilliams. So this this is like the earlier work on the uh, on, on the problem, and even in the last few years, this all of this. Uh, uh, the, the, the paper, the so the uh, the reference in the second line here, they're all from the last few years. But Rossi and Cotizelati, Vicol, Zillinger, Grenier, Guillen, Rosé, Soffer, Wei, Zheng, Zhao. Um, there are lots of papers on the linear stability. There are many situations one can consider and exactly what it means linear stability. That's also an issue. So the, there's been a lot of work, uh, a lot of work on understanding the linear stability of the of solutions of oil and Navier stocks. Uh, there's also a very classical result of Arnold. Uh, who proved the general stability result for the nonlinear equation using an energy method. So uh, using an energy method, meaning that one can say that the solution will stay in the solution will stay in a certain in a certain area in a certain uh, in a certain place in the, in the space of solutions, uh, but without being able to describe the, the behavior as the time goes to infinity. So that's uh, using an energy method. Um, now my talk uh, for the next uh, so for the next twenty for the next twenty minutes or so I'm going to talk about uh, nonlinear stability results and there are only three of them. Uh, so at the nonlinear level there are much fewer results and um, they're all very recent. There is the, the remarkable work of Bedrosian and Masmudi from 2015, uh, who proved nonlinear stability of the quet flow on the cylinder domain, the infinite cylinder cylinder domain T times R. Uh, so t t was the variable that was periodic, and r would be the so r would be the entire real line. So this would be an infinite cylinder. Um, now, um, the, the, the those solutions they don't have finite energy because the quet flow itself doesn't have finite energy on the real line. If we want to go to finite energy, then this is work of Hauge and myself who uh, proved the, to prove the nonlinear stability for the quet flow on the bounded channel, and we can take any interval. So this would be any bounded channel means a channel on a finite interval. And in this case is T times the interval zero one with a certain with a certain assumption on the boundary. So this is the, the quet flow, uh, which is as we saw earlier, the one of the nonlinear terms disappears. Um, then there's this, the case of point vortices, which uh, is work of Hauji and myself. And there is the case of general monotonic shear flows uh, satisfying the suitable spectral assumption in the finite channel, uh, in the finite channel t times zero one, and this is work of uh, Hao Jia and myself, and um, independently Masmudi and Zhao. So these are the uh, these are the only these are the only nonlinear stability results for the Euler equations. Um, now I'm going to discuss um, one of these terms. I'm going to start with the last term, the general monotonic shear flows, to get a sense of uh, what's involved in a in a full nonlinear theorem. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm, uh, on this slide and on the next slide, I'm going to state the theorem. Um, so uh, we are looking, so are looking at uh, the channel, the torus times the interval zero one, and we start to data that's compactly supported strictly inside the interval. So that's an important assumption. As I said, uh, the boundary effect, the boundary effects, they don't want to cooperate with the mechanism of VMVC, VMVC damping. And uh, we assume that this data is smooth, and it turns out the smoothness needs to be measured in a certain way through Gervais norms. I'm going to define them a little bit later, but one should just think of this as very smooth initial data, smooth and small initial data. And um, then we are looking at solutions starting from this smooth and small initial data. This is the system for the deviation for the perturbation omega. The system is dt omega plus boy dx omega minus b double prime of y dx psi plus u red omega is equal to zero. 
and u is obtained through the string function and then the derivatives of the string function is, is, as we said before. And um, we need to assume two conditions on the uh, two main conditions on the uh, shear flow B, one of them being uh, that is monotonic, so increasing, for example. And there's one more condition. Again, I'm going to have it a little bit later so as to be able to finish the statement of the theorem first. So there, there, there are some conditions on on the on the, on the stream on the on the shear flow that we require in order to prove stability. And then the conclusion is the following: that if we are looking at if we if we assume if we start to smooth smooth and small initial data, then you can construct a global solution. And the global solution does the following things. So uh, the asymptotic stability is expressed in terms of the fact that once that it wants to converge uh, after a suitable nonlinear perturbation. Uh, as I said, um, um, the solution itself has to select the final state. It's an important issue to understand what is the final state of the evolution. And uh, so the final the solution selects the final state, and it does this through this function. As we see, this function phi capital phi here. Uh, depends on a certain average, so this is an average. So, so we look at one component of solution u x, and we take an average, so we get uh, a function that depends. So the average meaning the zero mode. So we get the function that depends only on y. So this is the so this is constructed every time as the time increases. We construct this uh, uh, this correction dynamically, and the conclusion that if we correct it in the right way, then omega is going to converge to wants to converge to a final state. And it wants to cover in a, in a certain space that's a little bit weaker than the space we started with, but still a Gevre norm. And uh, we also have a rate of convergence. So this is the main conclusion that uh, uh, after this suitable correction, the vorticity wants to converge to a final state at a certain rate. Uh, now we can also derive uh, information about the other pieces of the of the flow. So for example, at the level we can construct the psi. So the uh, so the, the the stream function also want to converge in the natural way to to a final function to a final solution psi. Um, the velocity field itself, the zero mode. So this is the zero mode. These brackets of ux, the zero mode, wants to converge to a final state, so u infinity of y, at the rate being epsilon times t to the minus two. All the other modes want uh, will converge to zero at the rate of epsilon times t to the minus one. And the other component of the velocity field also converge to zero at the rate of epsilon times t to the minus two. All of these are consistent with what we've seen uh, even in the quet flow. So these are essentially the sharp rates that one can get, and everything is consistent with the uh, with the the example that I wrote in uh, that I wrote explicitly. Uh, so this is the so this is the uh, this is the main theorem that we prove, and um, th that's what asymptotic stability means. The core, the main conclusion is this conclusion over here, namely that after a suitable a suitable renormalization that's non-linear because it depends on the function itself, we have a convergence in a reasonably strong one. So that's the so this is the theorem. Uh, now there are two pieces, there, there are a couple of uh, spots in the theorem that uh, require definition. So we have the Gervais spaces. The Gervais spaces, um, it's a certain there's a certain way to measure smoothness of functions that turns out to be weaker. We need them to be we it needs to be weaker than analytic space because they also have to be completely supported inside the channel. But still, uh, it's not uh, it has to be an exponential type of smoothness. It's not possible to to run this kind of argument in uh, in Sobol F spaces. And the, the definition, the formal definition, that you look at the function f, we take its Fourier transform f tilde, and then we multiply with this weight e to the lambda times the length of the vector k c to the power s. The, the most important exponent here is s, so you can think that this would be uh, this would be the weight. Uh, if it was to be a Sobolev weight, for example, it had been logarithmic instead of this polynomial here, it would be the logarithm of, of the frequency. And S in our case, so S is an exponent between zero and one. In our theorem itself, S is the exponent, S is equal to one half. And the Gervais regularity is needed in all of these nonlinear asymptotic stability results that turns out to be something that's uh, uh, that's pretty clear by now. Even in um, going back, even to earlier work uh, uh, on the on the Vlasov-Poisson equation, Gervais regularity turns out to be needed for this type of situations. Uh, now, the more important condition is the condition on the uh, on the uh, stream on the on the shear flow B that allows for this theorem to hold. So B, the conditions that we have here, B is smooth according again to the Gervais spaces. Uh, B is monotonic, so B prime. 
is uh, B prime is controlled by a constant. Uh, now B double prime has to be zero at the boundary. So B is linear at the boundary. Uh, th this condition is important because you're in a bounded channel and we need to, we need to keep the um, we need to keep the vorticity supported away from the boundary in order to to not have to uh, otherwise we would uh, otherwise otherwise uh, we would have the boundary effect. And uh, the last condition that we need on B is that these operators, uh, so they're operators LK. So for any integer K, they're operators, and they are. One should think of them as applying as working on functions on on uh, the the K modes. And the operators, after we project to the K modes, the operators are simple operators, B of Y times F. So this is a multiplication operator minus B double prime times what would be the projection of the stream function. And the stream function is obtained in this way from F. And, uh, um, and the assumption is that uh, this operator, so this is an assumption you need to make, these operators don't have uh, any discrete eigenvalues. Uh, so these are the... So these are the assumptions that we make on um, on the shear flows uh, and uh, on the initial data, and then we prove a global regularity result. Um, uh, so we prove a global st an asymptotic stability result. Um, now, so the proof is com it's somewhat complicated because one has to so the proof the proof even in the quet flow is somewhat complicated because there are, uh, there are these uh, resonances there are certain resonances that we've seen even in the linear theory that there are resonances on the frequency of the type k times t that uh, will keep contributing and one has to understand these resonances and it turns out that there's a, a loss of smoothness in the uh, in the so the initial data starts being very smooth and the final state is less smooth uh, there's a loss of smoothness in the problem due to these resonances and understanding how still like to, to control the smoothness of the of the solutions to control the smoothness of the profile that's uh, that's uh, that's the main part of the argument so one has uh, there are certain weights so it's a, it's a kind of a complicated argument um now i'm going to discuss one more theorem because i wanted to get to a very interesting topic the topic of vortices uh, so, so this is a theorem. About, uh, the first theorem was about shear flow, and I'm going to talk about a, to a theorem about vortices. Uh, vortices, one can think of vortices as radial functions. Any radial function uh, at the level of the vorticity, any radial function stationary solution of uh, the 2D Euler. And um, now, of course, the, the only ones, only, only some radial functions can be stable. And uh, one could hope that the ones that are radially that are radial and which uh, decay. Uh, which decay, um, which decrease in space or radial decreasing, uh, those uh, those could be stable. So the so um, so what we'd like to understand is uh, this is a major open problem for 2D Euler, uh, the stability of uh, the stability of vortices of radially decreasing vortices. Uh, this was done at the linear level recently by Bedros and Cotizelati and Vico. and I'm going to talk also about the result of how and myself that we discovered the new phenomenon for the. Uh, for the vortices, for, for the smooth vortices. Now, the simplest case um, at the nonlinear level, so at the nonlinear level, it's an open problem to understand the stability of vortices at the nonlinear level. Uh, there's one case that we know how to do. There's the simplest case, the case of point vortices. Um, and here we have a very clean theorem that's uh, uh, that doesn't that, that that's simpler than than we know we know that it has to be it's simpler than the general case. Um, so point vortices are delta functions. One can think that we have a delta function at the origin, and one can think of the delta function as a radial function, that that would be a stationary solution. And what we are looking at, we are looking at solutions that are of the form a constant times a delta function plus a perturbation omega. So you have kappa times delta. Now, the, uh, the vortex itself is going to move. So it starts from time t is equal to 0, but p of t. So we can pretend here that p of 0 is equal to 0, but p of t, so the location of the vortex is going to move. It's going to move slightly during the evolution. And so you're looking for solutions of this type, kappa times delta at the point p of t plus a smooth function omega. Uh, that's uh, so. That's the perturbation. So kappa has to be different from zero. Um, so the the zero solution, of course, is not stable. The zero solution of uh, for for the two D for the two D order is not a stable solution. So the only way it gets stability is if the the solution that we perturb around uh, creates that stability. So kappa has to be different from zero. Is the strength of the point vortex. As I said, uh, the delta mass changes in time, and um, 
and then we are looking and then we are writing the equation. So if we think that this is the solution, we, we have the we, we need an equation for two parts. We need an equation for omega, the perturbation of uh, the smooth perturbation, and then we need an equation for the uh, location of the vortex. And the equation for omega is dt omega plus capital U grad omega plus little u times grad omega is equal to zero. Capital U is obtained from the from the vortex. So it's this, uh, this explicit function centered at the point P of T. So capital U is an explicit function. And little u, of course, is obtained in the same way. It's the gradient perpendicular of the, uh, of the stream function. And the stream, the stream functions obtain the solution of delta psi is equal to omega. So this is, the, this is the equation for omega. We also need to understand the equation for the center of the vortex. So this, the equation for the center of the vortex, P prime of T, is equal to gradient perpendicular psi at the point T comma P of T. So this is an OD. So P is, P is a two-dimensional point. So it has two components, P1 and P2, and it's an OD. Uh, so this is the system written explicitly for the, this is the stream, uh, this is, the, uh, this is the, this, the system for the perturbation written explicitly. And um, so the so the main uh, so the the main theorem that we have is that we have a clean theorem for the, for this problem, uh, namely that if we start with the uh, uh, if we start um, so this kind of a rough version I didn't I didn't make it as precise as the earlier theorem but basically what it says is that if we start to smooth initial data, and we know and we measure the smoothness in the same way in uh, in a Gervais space with exponent one half, and the smooth initial data is small. And if the smooth initial data is supported away from the from the support of the vortex, so you have the vortex at time t is, at, at x is equal to zero, and the vorticity omega naught is supported away from that, then the solution is going to stay global. And um, so basically, whatever we started is going to propagate. So the solution, the vortex, the center of the the center of the system is going to move to a point p of t, and the vorticity itself is going to stay smooth. It's, it loses the smoothness a little bit, but it's going to stay smooth in a slightly weaker Gervais space. And it will eventually, so omega of t will converge to a radial function, so to a smooth function omega infinity, which is radial with respect to the final state, to the final location of the vortex. So, so the entire system is going to converge to something stable. The final state is going to be another point p infinity, and the vorticity is going to be a uh, radial function around that point. And everything is, uh, so everything is, uh, it has the same level of complexity as the, is the shear flow problems in the sense that uh, uh, the location of the final vortex and uh, uh, and the function, the exact profile of the function omega infinity that depends on the entire evolution. So it's constructed, uh, it's constructed dynamically through the evolution. Um, so that's uh, so this is the theorem that we have uh, for point vortices. Um, and uh, the theorem involves there are similarities. So one can one can think that there are similarities between uh, uh, point vortices and shear flows. Um, now, what I wanted to talk about is more recent work uh, with the uh, how shear. So our goal is, of course, to understand uh, the, uh, the outstanding problem here is to understand the stability of the uh, of the general uh, general vortices, so general radially decreasing vortices. Uh, these are objects that all, that form through the evolution. So there are, there are many. There are many uh, numerical simulations that show that this, this kind of objects, the vortices, this radial decreasing vortices, they start they start forming through the evolution as if they are the solitons that the solution wants to converge to. And um, so here we found that there is a different phenomenon that we have to be aware of. So that I'm, I'm going to describe the problem first. So you're having capital omega is a given radial and radial decreasing function. So this is the vortex we like to perturb around. We like to write the solution little omega is uh, this vortex, uh, we know that the center has to move. We know the sequence from the point vortices that the center has to move plus a perturbation. So this is the, this is the kind of, so we want to solve the Euler equation with an assets of this type. Um, so P of T has to move. Um, now one can, one can write, so when we, when we make this kind of an asset, we can have, um, uh, so we can have, uh, uh, so we can write the equation. There are again, two objects that evolve. There is the location of the center P of T, which, uh, uh, will move through the evolution, and there is the function f, the perturbation, and we can write we can write the system. I didn't write it here because it will complicate more, and I wanted to get to to the main point. Um, now, uh, one one thing that we notice that that makes a big difference is that the picture that um, uh, the, the, so the the main new phenomenon that we noticed is that even at the linear level, the perturbation itself, we cannot hope to say that the perturbation is of the type 
of uh, oscillation times profile. Uh, namely, uh, all of the other, so the in, the in the simpler case of monotonic shear flows or point vortices, without thinking of all the technical details, the way one analyzes the solution is to, is to say that the solution decomposes in modes and it, each mode has an oscillation and the profile. And the profile stays smooth during the evolution and the oscillation can be described more or less explicitly in terms of the flow. This is the mechanism to control the flow. Uh, what we found is that, um, uh, what we found is that uh, in the case of the um, of the vortex, it's not true anymore. It's not true, uh, and at the very least, we need to allow two. So that picture is not true anymore, even at the linearized level. At the very least, we need to allow two types of uh, for every mode here. We need to allow two types of uh, oscillations. So have a profile that oscillate that oscillates uh, uh, at this rate u of r over r. So this is a function capital U is a function that depends on. Uh, that depends on the uh, on the vortex omega plus another function that has no oscillation. So that's uh, so this is the this is the kind of decomposition that we need to uh, allow at the level of um, of the vorticity in the uh, in the uh, in the for the general uh, for the general vortices. And bo both of them are, are are smooth uniformly in R over the entire uh, uh, over for time for t positive. Um, and one can actually think of this, they are very naturally, so this, uh, uh, they, these are very naturally uh, physically, they, they have physical explanations. The, the one that oscillates, so the first profile here that oscillates at this speed, this comes from the, from the effects inside the fluid. And the second profile comes come from the effect of the, uh, of the center. So X is equal to zero. And... Um, that counts as a boundary. So the the there's not there's not a physical boundary, but uh, the center of the vortex counts as a boundary and it generates a de an, an oscillation of a different. This um, uh, generates a different type of profile. Now, uh, maybe I didn't emphasize this when when proving nonlinear uh, when proving nonlinear stability, identifying this oscillation is extremely important because at the end of the day, uh, the profile the the. Uh, the mechanism of the proof is to say that after I take out the oscillation, uh, the, the profile, which means the remaining functions fk1, fk2, they stay smooth and they stay smooth uniformly, um, uniform, essentially almost uniformly as the time goes to infinity. But if one doesn't identify the correct oscillation, the whole thing breaks down because you see the, the oscillation here, if, you, if one was to take derivatives in R of this oscillatory factor, then we want to pick up factors of t. And if you take two degrees, three degrees, pick up two factors of t or three factors of t. So the, the whole mechanism breaks down unless you identify very precisely uh, the oscillation. So um, the fact that we need, we need to think that we have different pieces that oscillate in different ways means that uh, one cannot hope to have, uh, one cannot hope to have the same type of proof. Um, one cannot hope to, uh, to have the same kind of proof that you're able to, uh, arranged in the quet flow or in the monotonic shear flow where there's only one piece. Um, and that's what I'm saying here, that uh, the st this structure, the structure, the fact that there are multiple oscillations presents a new and possibly dif uh, significant difficulty for the nonlinear problems is the method used in all the nonlinear EVC damping results relies crucially on proving uh, smoothness of a well-defined profile for the vorticity. And uh, here, given that there are two, at least two different profiles, they're actually more, this is the linear level. Um, now we propose what we did in, uh, so what uh, we did in uh, with the Haoshia is we propose a different strategy. Instead of looking at the profile of the vorticity, we look at a different function, the so-called, what we call the spectral density function. And the spectral density function is obtained in the following way. It's, it's written, it's a little bit easier to write everything at the level of the stream function, not at the level of the vorticity. So at the level of the stream function, it's kind of, it's almost like taking a certain renormalized Fourier transform in, in T of the stream function. So the stream function itself can be written as E to the minus I K. Now this capital B, these are, uh, these are explicit functions that depend on the, uh, on the original vortex. And the, so the, the main object is the spectral density function theta K. So we basically write the, uh, the stream function in terms of this, this function theta k. So the theta k becomes the object that we study. One, uh, once we know theta k, we know everything else. So the theta k becomes the object that we study. And it turns out that um, at the linear level, we can prove that theta k, 
um, is smooth. Is smooth. It's it's very smooth in the second variable and uh, has some the right the, an optimal kind of smoothness in the first variable. In the variable uh, in the first variable being here v uh, v minus w. And now the smoothness of the the smoothness of theta k. That's knowing smooth knowing the function theta k is smooth. We can use afterwards stationary phase arguments. And it turns out that uh, we can uh, we can we can the the the, the, the primary object is theta k. Once we have control of, the, of its smoothness, we can uh, derive this type of decomposition essentially by looking where are the main contributions, where are the stationary contributions of this oscillatory integral. So that's how. Uh, so this is how we control the flow. Now, uh, this is at the linear level. This whole thing is at the linear level, and at the linear level, we can close the argument. Uh, and we can prove, um, in particular, once we have this type of description, we can also prove decay. So we can we can reprove the linear stability, uh, what's called the linear, what would be called the linear uh, the linear stability results. You can reprove those. Uh, more importantly, we have an object that um, that uh, could play the role of a profile uh, because the class, the, the physical space profiles, they it's unclear it's unclear if they can be used. Uh, so this is the. And so this is the um, so this is the result the, the the so at the level for the for the uh, general for the general vortices we have this result at the linear level um, now um, so I have um, I only have uh, one more quick uh, I have only have a couple of more slides that I wanted to discuss a slight extension of this uh, uh, of this work um, which refers to a slightly more general equations. Uh, we, we have the 2D Euler, and we have uh, also in two dimensions have a slightly more general equation. This, this is called the uh, service quasi geostrophic equation uh, SQG, and actually the generalized SQG that depends on another exponent alpha. And it's almost the same as the uh, um, it's almost the same as the uh, the Euler equation in two dimension. The only difference is that the um, uh, the stream function is not obtained by taking the inverse Laplacian, but by obtained by taking this slightly Less uh, so, so it's slightly less, less regular in the sense that Laplacian is this fraction Laplacian the power minus one plus alpha over two, and alpha would be an exponent between zero and two. The case alpha is equal to one is the classical case of the surface of the SQG equation. The case alpha is equal to zero is the case I discussed earlier, the two D incompressible, and the case alpha is equal to two produced stationary solutions. And now this a uh, Pretty well known open problem to construct global solutions of it's very hard to construct any global solutions of this equation. Even, even families, the only global solutions that are known for any alpha strictly positive, the only global in time solutions are uh, solutions that would be periodic in time. So they are global in time because they're actually periodic in time. And that's uh, construction of course, uh, Castro, Cordoba, and Gomez Serrano. And uh, this was extended recently to quasi-periodic solutions by Hassani, Agnidi, and Masmudi. So there are, there are some families of uh, uh, periodic, time, time periodic, time quasi-periodic solutions. Um, but, uh, but still, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, the, it's not clear how to construct families of global solutions. Um, actually, we were, uh, Castro, uh, uh, Cordoba, Gomez, Serrano, and myself, we have a paper in which we construct a family of global solutions, but of infinite energy. Uh, now, our my hopes, so our hope was that we'll be able to use the mechanism of invisible damping to to solve this problem as well, to at least to find some uh, some families of global solutions. So we are hoping to find some families of global solution in a neighborhood of what would be the quet flow. This is written in terms of the vorticity. So theta is equal to minus one would be the solution corresponding to quet flow. One can write the perturbation. One can write the perturbation in terms of omega. So omega is the theta plus one would be the vorticity perturbation, and one can get um, one can get the system. It looks uh, so at first glance. It looks like uh, looks rather similar to uh, to the Euler system, um, and uh, we were hoping. So we we're hoping that we'd be able to adapt some of the ideas from invisible damping to at least for some parameters alpha positive, at least for some parameters to be able to construct families of global solution. Uh, one can still perform uh, more or less the change of variables. One can still derive. One can still work all the algebra as if it was um, a solution of the Euler equation. And at the end of the day, we end up with a slight with a system that's uh, of this type. It's actually more complicated, but we only selected one term, the so-called reaction term. And uh, uh, just so a simplified version of the system to get is DTF minus, uh, this would be the reaction term, dV 
times phi times dzf is equal to zero. And phi is obtained in terms of f in the Fourier space by dividing by dividing by this denominator that we've seen also in the quet flow. The quet flow for the uh, for the uh, for the uh, Euler equation. And so this this is a this looks like a somewhat it's kind of a simpler a simple system. Uh, however, what we found is that the mechanism of this in VC damping completely collapses. There is no way to to prove stability for this. For any for alpha is equal to zero, we already did it as part of the analysis of the quet flow. But for any alpha strictly positive, it's just a little bit too weak, and there is no way. There is a cascade that keeps increasing the resonances, and there is no way uh, to prove. Um, uh, to prove stability, so this is work that uh, I've done. Also, I've done with my uh, collab, my, my former colleague and collaborator, Javi Gomez Serra. So it turns out that basically what I meant to say is that uh, uh, the mechanism of VC damping turns out to be very. It's a very somewhat very uh, unstable mechanism, and it does not extend to uh, solutions of the SQG for any alpha strictly positive. And um, it looks like I'm um, about. Uh, this is my last slide, so I'm um, so I'm going to finish here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks to Professor Idus Kut's uh, excellent talk, and also thanks for attending this uh, session. So uh, so time is perfect. I don't know whether we still have time for one or two questions. Is there any questions? Uh, let me check the chat room if, to see whether there's any questions. So no, no there. So 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 maybe I can ask one question. Yes. I, uh, so so in the first film, uh, you mentioned the Jure function st uh, space. Is it the index optimal? Uh, yes, yes, the index is okay. one half, and that's, one half, that's yeah. optimal yeah. for this problem. That depends on for the Vlasov Poisson data is one third, so it's not that depends on the problem, the exact index. Okay, let's see. For this, for this problem, one half is optimal. Yes, that that was the even for the quet flow, that was the theorem of uh, Deng and Masmodi. Good, good, good. I see. And and any attempt, uh, if the flow, the background flow is not sure flow, uh, but depends on the spatial. The, the tangential variable no we are pretty far from that so we are um, the right now uh, what i uh, maybe i should have said that what we expect is that for all the other shear flows is for the monotonic ones will have this picture with the multiple uh, multiple profiles that prevents mm -hmm. the proof basically so okay. yes we don't know uh we don't know okay. We don't know how the, for the Poisson flow, for example, for, for B of Y is equal to Y squared. We don't know that there is a, we don't, I don't know if it's true or not. Global okay, thank asymptotic you. stability. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks also to the audience.